you start living with the end in mind, everything starts to change. What are people going to say about you? What message is your life going to speak when you're long gone? Because you weren't born by accident. You didn't just happen to be where you're at and happen to watch this video. There is always a reason. Boom, here we go. So, welcome to this Fuse Life podcast, episode 153. My guest today was on episode 15. So, <laughs> we have come a journey. And uh, we've done three episodes together that so many people really loved because it's a casual conversation, but it's serious and simple and beautiful. And I know that's going to happen today. I have uh, so much respect for my guest because of his ability to simplify the gospel, which I think is the gospel. It is simple, not necessarily always easy, but simple to grasp and move into. And thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people around the world have heard this man speak on the new creation reality and have just been able to receive it in its simplicity. And it has changed so many lives. So Chris Blackaby, thank you so much for being with me today. I'm super excited for this chat. Uh, yeah, it's good to be back, actually. Every time I um, I seem to uh, relaunch public speaking, I talk to you first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm about to start public speaking again in, uh, well, tonight, not tomorrow night, but in proper uh, in April. So, yeah. That's amazing. I think that's happened too two or three times right in yeah, a significant so. way yeah 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 so just for those that maybe don't know you can you give us a quick little intro like who are you what are you about and where are you currently okay well my name's chris and i'm currently in colorado springs usa and uh i've relocated here uh to america based in alabama uh and i work for a charity or christian group called as he is ministries and i do speaking on, on their behalf and they do other things as well and my primarily primarily i worked out is i preach the gospel to the church <laughs> i evangelize christians i think that's what i'm doing and um yeah and my the only ministry in the new testament is to reconcile man to god the ministry of reconciliation and that's the ministry we have and that's what i'm doing I'm, I, I the the gospel is the power of god to change your life and um so i pretty much stay at the gospel i don't go much other places if you've heard me speak you've heard me speak <laughs> you know i mean i only got a few messages and um and when people ask me to come speak i say have you heard me speak? I said, yeah. I said, well, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> I don't have another, another cross or another Jesus. Like, but, uh, people love hearing the gospel and it's always new. And so that's what I do. I, 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 I preach the gospel to Christians. Not exclusively though. <laughs> if you're non Christian, I'll also give you the gospel. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, man. And, uh, guys, I've got all these links in the caption check out his youtube channel there's so much gold in there so how i met chris was because i was listening to a message from someone else and in the first five minutes they make reference to chris and as soon as they do that i feel something happen in my spirit so mm -hmm. i search up who is this chris and i found all this content around uh sonship and hundredfold and the simplicity of the gospel and i just started binge listening to all the stuff i had a road trip and I must have done nine hours there and back just listening to the stuff. And then I, I feel the Lord say to me to contact him. So I contact him one or two days later. And that's exactly when he's coming back into public speaking. <laughs> and boom. So the content, man, will change your life. It's changed so many people's lives. So, Chris, it's so good for me. Like, I feel like I just have a chat with you because I'm so curious and you're so amazing. And then people just get to listen in and they seem to love that too, which <laughs> I think is great. <laughs> Um, so why don't we start here? Like you mentioned that you're in a studio and it's a worship studio and yeah, yeah. I love, I mean, the mix worship. Studio. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love corporate worship, right? Like, I feel like there is something powerful that does happen there. Mm. Um, why don't we open that subject worship? 
how we've seen it done in church, what it really means, what is the goal? What do you think? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, worship has become, that term has almost exclu exclu exclusively become um, singing, and uh, which is not singing is worship. Uh, if you do it, if, you, if you're worshiping. And so uh, we have um, also practicing the presence of God. We're doing the dishes as worship, you know. And so two things is that um, uh, meeting together and worshiping and singing together is extraordinary and a great thing to do. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get too far down the track, but um, the trouble is when you sing and what you, you speak, you're singing out and um, lots of the songs we sing are written by um, people in their personal time between them and God. And then we're seeing them as, as large groups and maybe the theology isn't so good because, um, well, that might be an emotional response in the moment. It's probably not a good thing to be singing over, over our, us repeatedly all the time um, because you are framing up your world with your words. So uh, I think uh, as I do believe, this is going to change topics very quickly. I do believe that there's a new era coming. There's a shift coming in right now. Uh, I think in seven years, um, what Christianity is, uh, how, how it's expressed in the earth is going to change dramatically. And, uh, and that will come with new understandings. And worship, as in the singing worship, normally carries the, um, the revelation of the times. You know, whatever's happening, whatever the Wesleys are up to, that was their that was their worship. And uh, when we worked out God was he could heal, you know, we thanked Him for that. And when God's a good Father, we thanked Him for that. And they're all good things. So I think worship's going to change, and the lyrics are going to change, and how we engage as a group is going to change. Um, so you talking about worship is coming together and singing, uh, that will that will continue forever. Um, but what, who is singing? The understanding mm. of who's singing? The sons of God are singing to God, and won't sing like won't sing songs like "You are God in heaven, and here I, I on earth." You know, which is a great song if you're an Old Testament king under the old covenant. But we're in heaven, you know, and I uh, won't sing songs like rend the heavens and come down because he has. He won't send, sing songs like do not shut the heavens because he, he can't. It's you, mm. you know, heaven, heaven's in my heart. <laughs> Kingdom is within. So once we understand uh, the new creation that we are, uh, and then we'll stop asking God to do things he's already done. And we'll stop asking God to do things he's asking us to do. Uh, lots of our songs and lyrics will go, um, and uh, that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And with it will come a new sound as well. So as far as singing worship is concerned, I think it's going to change, and uh, it's going to be based on a new understanding of the thing that we are, sons of God, and where we are, raised seed in heavenly places, and that we already have everything we need for life and godliness within us. And so I don't know, I don't know what those words are going to be, but mm -hmm. they will change. And uh, life will become worship because you are a son of God doing the dishes. You're a son of God going to work and being a barista or a lawyer or a mother, you know. And you will know that the being that you are is the righteousness of Christ. And the, right, and the being that you are, this righteousness of Christ, will, um, is the person doing these things. And so... Uh, that, that understanding of complete unity with Christ will make all things worship. And that's not me, all right? I'm not, I'm not, that's not I want to be that guy. But uh, I think that that's where we're going. That, um, yeah, I think that's where this conversation will go now. But a shift is the fivefold ministry. So ministry was there to build the saints up to the fullness of the stature of Christ. And uh, there's... I don't know anyone in the fullness of the statue of Christ or close, <clears throat> but that's what the gifts are for. So we haven't been using them the way they were supposed to be used. And um, so right at the moment, ministry, uh, not wrong, but ministry will gather around a gift. 
you know, a strong uh, ministry, a strong apostolic gift, a strong worship uh, teaching gift. We gather around the gift and we build ministries around those gifts. And that's how it's, how it's been. And that's okay. But we'll be shifting now because uh, the gifts are only there to reconcile you to the Father. So if I got a prophetic gift, I take someone's hand <laughs> and say, here's the Father. There's the light. <laughs> Where's that light? <laughs> but so um, <clears throat> here's the Father. Though. And then uh, you won't need a priest. Mm. And you may not even need uh, a worship leader as such. And, uh, and which is not like, so if you're a worship leader, do it. Like, keep going. Yep. And then a shift will come. And the shift's going to be difficult for people who, if you find your use, your identity in the expression of your ministry, because the expression will change. There'll still be apostles and prophets until the fullness of the stature of Christ. But um, they, it's just a jacket. <laughs> Useful. This is just my apostle jacket. I get up, my jacket's in full use. I have a grace to reveal certain aspects of the nature of God, and it has an effect. Or well, someone got up and said the exact same words as me, it just doesn't work. Because I don't have the jacket. It's just a grace gift from Jesus. I'm an apostle. I'm not, but I'm saying, you know, I'm an apostle. And then I'm going to get down because I'm not the full statue of Christ. And I need the evangelist or the pastor or the teacher to get up because I'm down on the Son of God and He's giving to me. Mm. And that's all those gifts are for. To build everyone up to the fullness of the statue of Christ. Oops, excuse me. Uh, build everyone up to the fullness of the statue of Christ. Mm. And, uh, and to have direct access with God. So heaven worship will be more understand we're in heaven around the throne, and um, and uh, a singular worship leader or that probably uh, it won't be the same. <laughs> we're moving to how it is in heaven, and gathered around Christ. And when I say that, I not to say that current ministries don't aren't doing that as such, but the expression will be uh, you won't need a priest. In fact, the new covenant um, in Jeremiah 31, it says, I'll give you a new covenant. So this is where we get the new covenant from, Jeremiah 31. It's from here, and it defines it here. So we need to have to ask what the new covenant is. It's defined for us. So this whole thing's repeated in Hebrews as well. It says, I'll give you a new covenant. I'm going to remember your sins no more. Okay. And then, uh, and then um, he says, and no one will need to teach you. Not your mother, your brother, your sister, your teacher, your whatever, your, your neighbor. Because I'm going to teach you myself. I'm going to teach you myself. Mm. The new covenant is I don't remember your sins anymore, and no one needs to teach you because I'll teach you myself. That's what new covenant is. Well, have you ever heard that preached in front of church? Mm -hmm. I'm not a teacher. I'm here to teach you that you don't need a teacher. And my whole my whole goal is to, to transform you by the renewing of your mind, so you can have direct access to God and understand Him correctly. But then you don't need me because you know Him directly, and that's why John says. No one needs to teach you because the anointing within you continues to teach you. Mm. Have you ever heard a pastor say to his congregation, no one needs to teach you because <laughs> the anointing within you continues to teach you? Okay. Well, we haven't used the gifts properly to build people into the fullness of the stature of Christ. So they have direct access to God themselves. Yeah. And mm. our, our whole goal is to use these jackets to uh, help people be transformed in their mind. Because Christianity or sonship is the process of becoming what you already are. I'm already a son of God, okay? But I'm not behaving like one. I don't feel like one. I believe like one. Um, so people have gifts. So a prophetic word can it really help me, change something in me, and then now look more like, well, I already am. That reality of Christ can come out. And that's all they're doing. Help me become what we already are. Because Jesus did the work. And now ministry is just to serve the purpose of the work that Jesus has done so that people can, so that that seed that's in them of sonship can reach the fullness of stature of Jesus. Because we are to be like the risen Christ in the body. And that's what God wants. And Paul was frustrated when it didn't happen. And, you know, hey, well, you know, you, you should be teachers by now. <laughs> or wherever wrote Hebrews, <laughs> you know. He thought it would be happening to everyone. That's what he expected. But we don't expect that now, and we don't build towards it. And um, being a Christian may not survive shifts in government reach and other things that are happening on the earth. If you're a Christian, like just in your mind, I'm a Christian, and God's up there, and I'm down here. 
and you know hold on to get to heaven you need to know that god has washed all your sins away you can boldly approach him at any time and uh, you, you have access to the resources of heaven like jesus had access to the resources of heaven and then you won't be trapped on the earth because fear all fear is fear of death and fear will trap you to the earth and if I, I, only people that can control you is if they have something that um you need or want yeah so if someone's got something you want they've got leverage and control over you uh in any way love approval money etc so if you don't know that god will give it to you through relationship in christ then you will go somewhere else to get it mm. and that person becomes your father that's mammon you can't serve god and mammon you can't it's impossible you need to know that you're righteous and clean before god his son and he would give it to you because of jesus and then you don't fear death any death reputation death social death physical death financial death because you're in heaven already like in the next billion years you're, st you're there and you're living that out on earth and then uh if someone tries to take your freedom from you <laughs> or your food from you or your finances from you uh to control what you think or say or believe they have no leverage over you because heaven's gonna look after you because you're a son of god but if you don't understand that then you have to go where the money goes and if let's say money became digital and to have a digital account you need to sign up to uh the equity for all act hmm. which means many terrible things can happen to terrible people and you can't stop it in the name and if you oppose it you're full of hate well if i don't sign up to this against my will against my belief systems i won't have money so now you've got a, a point where they have something you need <laughs> and you have to change your mind hmm. this you can see this leading to a very dark place if it happens but the point is god is a step ahead always and we're going to have access to heaven and that's going to come through this light that's going to come through um uh, the revelation of who we are in jesus christ the beings that we are and what we have access to yeah all right from worship <laughs> but that is that is the answer it's a temp yeah the current expression of worship is is temporary because a new move is coming does make this one wrong inferior new revelation new sound new style etc man so there's so many places we can go right because we just did a full yeah overview which is amazing and by the way like i'm like i'm very happy to ask one question and then you go for 30 right. minutes just so you know so um i don't even know which subject to pick now but maybe because i am in this lane of coaching right yeah. like when in 2020 uh, april march april 2020 i quit my fitness business right? i feel commissioned by the lord to mobilize his body into their purpose so don't preach about it don't teach about it coach them into it and i feel this real urge to help people move in what god's put in them not just talk about it so it we've got this pattern that we've all gone to church and listened and love hearing things and the truth goes in. And to an extent, we allow that truth to have its way in us to then cause something to happen. So just taking that into account, it might be cool if we can go a little deeper into some of what you said and just see some practicalities, you know? Yeah. Okay. Like, so it's, it's the era that we haven't seen yet. Um, and so, <clears throat> It could be just a minor shift, but in my mind, it's uh, it's uh, a world or an olam in Hebrew expression is 2,000 years. So the first 2,000 years was the patriarchs, you know, and then to up to, oh, not the first 2,000 years is like Adam and Eve to Abraham. The next 2,000 years is Abraham to Jesus. The next 2,000 years is Jesus to us. So that's six days, about the 6,000 years, six years to a day. Mm -hmm. And we're entering into day seven, which is quite significant. And it's, it's two days since Jesus died, <laughs> you know, 2,000 years. And then we're entering the third day, which is the resurrected son. 
So <clears throat> the shift that's coming, I would say, is as grand as any of those other shifts. Like out of, in Eden, out of Eden, that's the first shift. <laughs> as we started counting time. Okay, that's a big shift. Yep. Then Abraham could receive righteousness by faith. He believed it was accounting as righteousness. And that laid the platform for the Messiah, not the law. Abraham. That's what we inherit, the faith of Ab the promise of Abraham. And then Jesus came, okay, and went from the law for them to grace, to salvation through believing in the person who completed the law for them. And that was given to the Gentiles, to us as well. That's a huge shift. Yeah. So you imagine that <laughs> it's 33 AD, you are working, you are a, a, a Levite priest and you've done really well. You love God. You love, you love Yahweh, though you can't say that name. And uh, you learned the laws and you've learned how to be a priest and you, you've gone through all the procedures and you've memorized the, the five, first five books of the Bible and you can chant them all and, and you're getting ready to be the high priest. Yeah. Mm. And it's so with good heart, and great integrity. Then you get yourself right and go through the purification thing to plead on behalf of Israel to have their sins atoned for for another year. And uh, this is what you want to do for all your life. You're giving your whole life to it. And then some guy called Jesus dies on the cross, raises again, rips the curtain, and ends that. And now all the capital you had in being expert in Levitical law is now has no currency in the next era. You're the best, the best, and rightly so, like in good heart and everything, did it really well. And then <laughs> the season changes and a new era, a new olam, a new world has come and you don't know anything about it. And you have to go and listen to fishermen. The fishermen met Jesus. You, go, you don't know nothing. So you have to go talk to the fishermen, uneducated fishermen, and they're going to tell you about it because they saw it and you didn't. All right, mm. that's a big shift. Now imagine a shift as big as that again, where wherever you are in ministry, wherever I am in ministry, wherever you are in your Christianity, it shifts, and all your currency from this era may not mean anything in the next era, mm. and a currency in the next era may be, did you learn to love? <laughs> you know, and uh, I was love. You'd lay your life down for the wicked. Right. Hmm. I built a big church, <laughs> you know, or I still gave a lot of prophetic words. That's I know they're very accurate, powerful. You're persecuted for them. Well done. Would you lay your life down for the wicked? You know, or mm. you, you know, we know what wicked are and we've gone after them and we've, but we've never interceded for them and prayed for them. You know, um, if some major prophet got up today and said, California is going to the sea. I think the church should be like, yeah, in the sea, in the sea, you know, like <laughs> get those bad guys, you know, but not like let's intercede for California. That, that doesn't happen. Mm. Save those lives, Lord. Give them another 10 years or whatever. Like let revival come, whatever, any, any example you want. And uh, so we need to become like our father. Cause if you bless those who persecute you and pray for those, uh, if you bless those who curse you and pray for those who persecute you, then you'll be like your father in heaven. Okay. Mm. That's, that's what the son is. Looks like his father. Yeah. Who sends rain on the good and the evil? And we need to understand that as Christians, we can send rain on the good and the evil. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Like our father. <laughs> Who, Jesus was the exact representation of the father. And he laid his life down before the foundation of the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, Abraham pleaded on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. Moses pleaded on behalf of Israel. He said, Write me out of salvation and write them in. Don't write them out. Write me out. I'll exchange myself for them. I mean, that's love, you know, that's because mm. um, they were wicked. They were doing wicked things. And Jesus did it. And, Peter, and Rome, Paul said it in Romans. He said, I'd rather be written out of the book of life that all Israel be saved. I'd rather lose my salvation and be removed from God forever that all Israel would be saved, if that be possible. That was his heart. That's how much he loved them. And that's a miracle. I don't love mm. it that much. <laughs> no way. Okay. But my in me is that nature already. The nature of the son. The true son looks like the father. So in me, I already in the person lays life down for the wicked. But 
I need to change, be renewed by, be transformed renewed in my mind, right? And how's that happen? Faith comes through hearing or the foolishness of preaching. We haven't preached it. We haven't preached mature sonship, which is, <laughs> uh, you know, you may die for a righteous man, but no one's going to die for a guilty man. But this is love, that while we're yet sinners, he died for us. We are, you know, agape love. Well, that's us. Everything you learn about God, you learn about yourself. Mm. <laughs> oh, we're like, oh, God's agape love. God's this one way love. He loves all. Yep, that's you. And when you're that, you are attached to the unlimited resources of heaven. Mm. Uh, oh, um, for me, not the one that, that what impacted me the most uh, was the story of Stephen. Uh, and I'll just tell you what it is. And I'll give you my my interpretation, right? <laughs> so this is scripture at six and seven. Uh, Stephen, who may have been a deacon, um, was going around performing great signs, wonders, and miracles, like just ripping it up and uh, uh, and preaching. And then the the priests and the, and um, the Judaizers come to him and they're like, "What are you doing?" And his face shone like an angel. Mm. Which means you're transfigured, right? So when you're transfigured, it's like your soul and your body look like your spirit man. So what did he do? He made a decision. We'll get into that. But he um and he says to him the whole history of Israel. <laughs> he tells him, You killed the Messiah. And he says, I see him right now, <laughs> next to God, next to Yahweh. <laughs> so he invokes the death penalty. And as they're killing him, he says, Forgive them, Lord, they know not what they do. Okay, so he quotes Jesus, and then there's a guy there called Saul. They later become Paul, and everyone gives him their jackets. He holds the jackets. Why? Why uh, Stephen gets stoned? So that's that's what happened, and this is what I believe about it. Is that I believe in that morning, um, Jesus talked to Stephen and said, "Hey, I'm the land slain before the foundation of the world." I lay my life down for the wicked. And Stephen's like, yeah, that was me. I was the wicked. You know, you did it for me. Yeah. Well, I was evil. You you come and save me. And, and now I have your nature and I'm a son of God. Like, I'm very happy with that. And Jesus says, you know, the call I have in your life to go and preach to the Gentiles and perform signs, ones and miracles, perform the word and to write great theology and to, to affect generations to come. He's like, yeah, uh, amazing. And then Jesus says, all right, there's a guy named Saul. Uh, he is going to do evil things. He hasn't started yet. But coming up, he's going to murder Christians, your brothers and sisters, slaughter them, and do great evil and harm. What I'm asking you is, this great future you have, this role on the earth and all your inheritance and everything, all your fruit and all your crowns and all your record on the earth, would you lay it down for him so he can do it, to give him the, the, the free choice of choosing it? And Stephen said, yes, I'm going to lay my life down for the wicked, for this murderous man who hasn't even started to murder yet. I'm going to do it. And that's why his face shone like an angel. Like when Jesus transfigured before he went to Jerusalem, he made his decision, I'm doing it. I'm laying my life down. And he, so he looked like the father. He transfigured. And Stephen looked like the father. He transfigured. His light, his light, spirit, and love. And that's what God is. And so he lays his life down. And that's why Paul had such a knockout conversion because Stephen lays his life down for it. It's sown that seed. And then Paul lives out Stephen's record. And wow. uh, that sonship. If you, if that's your heart, you can have God's stuff because you use it the right way. When that's not your heart, you can't have God's stuff, right? So James and John say, hey, that town, they went good to us. Shall we cool down fire on them? Mm. Jesus says, you don't know what spirit you're of. He doesn't say, what? Cool down fire? You can't do that. Because <laughs> they could. Mm. You know? Well, that's amongst the group, <laughs> including Jesus, that's one of the options. And he says, you don't know what spirit you're of. You know, who's your father? That's what he's saying. You don't know who your father is. Mm -hmm. I lay my life down for those people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's sonship. 
and that's what's already inside you. This this nature that's expressed in the Sermon on the Mount is not something to attain to. Okay, it's something that already is you. It's describing you. The Sermon on the Mount describes the kingdom, which is impossible to attain. So you receive it in receiving the person of Jesus Christ. So you have His nature because you have Him, <laughs> right? I have the nature. You receive Jesus when you got saved. You didn't get salvation. You receive Jesus Christ, and He is your salvation. Christ is your salvation. The fact you have Him, okay, He is your righteousness, and He's your salvation. He is your right standing before God. That's what He is. So no man can boast. You can't boast of anything except Christ, because that's the only thing you've got before God. Yeah, and so you have that nature. Your nature already is to lay your life down on behalf of the wicked, is to forgive. Forgiveness is your core nature. Yeah. Because you look like the Father. You're born of Him. You're of His substance. You're of His nature. You have the faith of God, the love of God, you know, the joy of the Lord. You have His stuff. But you won't. You can't use it if you are still uh, living at the tree of knowledge of good and evil and setting measure and judgment. Like those people deserve good stuff. Most people deserve bad stuff. Mm. Is that what heaven's doing? Could be, but is that what heaven's doing? Because if you've got ten bucks, and then your friends running an orphanage, you know, do you give that ten dollars to the orphanage? And then you see not, and you got, you still got one, you got one ten, love ten dollar, you got one ten dollar note. There's some guy who, you know, got drunk. He always gets drunk. He went gambling. He lost all his money. He's drunk in the gutter, and he's done it to himself again. And you got ten dollars. So what do you do? What's good use of funds? What's good sowing and reaping? Well, give it to the person running the orphanage. Is that what heaven's doing? Heaven, if you asked, if you didn't, if you just left that measure behind and joined the father and what he's doing today, he might say, yeah, give the $10 to the guy on the ground. Mm. I'll work for this $10. Why would I give it to him? That's not good investment. He's just going to eat it. And God's like, yeah, he's hungry. Mm. Oh, I, I know. So I'll, I'll give it to him and he'll see how good I am. And then he will go, wow, God's good. He's going to clean himself up and come to church. Because like, no, no, no. He's in the gutter. He needs $10. <laughs> Just give it to him. Because that's when you're living from heaven, that $10 is God's $10. It doesn't matter. You just give it. That's what heaven's doing. Because you've you got resources. to Anything God wants to do, you've got resources for. But as long as you're doing it the, way, the same way he would do it. Because that's good to all. And maybe that guy cursed you and persecuted you. You still give him the $10. <laughs> you know? Because that's what that's what Jesus would do. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. what God would do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Jesus healed people that came to kill him. Put their ear back on. They're there to kill him. <laughs> mm. <laughs> They're to arrest him. Talk about good to all. Yeah. That's what... <laughs> That's uh, that's uh, that's we've got to be sons. So yeah. I don't know what the new era looks like as such, but it's definitely that. It's definitely uh, well. That was an example. We're saying like it's going to change, like from you know from before Jesus to after Jesus. And that was a big shift, and then it, all your assets, <laughs> spiritual ministry assets, uh, don't work in the new era. Mm. And like when the new era is coming along now, um, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it's love and only love. And then God says, all right, okay, new era. I'm going to need some people to help run the church. That grandma who looked after her great, who didn't go into retirement, end up looking after her grandchildren, a thankless job. Uh, <laughs> that guy over there that uh, that prayed in his, in his prayer closet and didn't tell anyone ever, <laughs> you know, um, that person over there, uh, who uh, forgave the person who killed their child and went and visited them in the hospital, in, in, in jail, and told them that God forgives them and adopted the killer in place of his own child and their ministers with him. Him, <laughs> like, if I got 10,000 see the church, like, I've got a worship anointing. It's like, who? It's not what? Not what jacket you have, or even how well you've used your jacket, which is good. It's good to use your jacket well. Mm, you know, mm. well. But it's who and who is love? Yeah. Did you learn to love, as Bob Jones would say? Mm. That's it. And that's a miracle. Because that, that love that God wants 
you don't have. It's got to come from somewhere else. It's got to come from heaven down, you know. Man, so we could keep going on this. Yeah. <laughs> but so just to wrap up, like, so my question, because we we're talking about like purpose, right? And maybe you would say purpose. I'm, I'm just trying to put this in a way where, okay, let's say someone says to you, okay, it's in me. I want it out. I want to move yeah. in it. Yeah. I want it to grow. I want yeah. to, I want to see this happen in my life, Chris. What, yeah. How do I do that? Yeah. So two things about your coaching, doesn't matter what you do, it's who's doing it. You're mm. a self God coaching now. Okay. Or the laundry. And that who is very, that who looks exactly like Jesus. Okay. So now you're like, okay, Chris, I want it. So, uh, yeah. That's me too. Like, yeah. <laughs> like if God said to me, Hey, Chris, you know, uh, Israel's in trouble. Would you be separate from him, me forever? So all Israel will be saved. I was like, Mm. Nah. <laughs> you know, what what's what what does it look like to be separate from you? Let me have a look. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, Man. No way. Okay, so it's it's a miracle that nature. Okay. It it has to come from somewhere else. You know, will I lay down my life, my future for some guy who hasn't yet began to be evil and he's gonna spend ne next next ten years killing Christians and eventually become a Christian? Well, exchange for him. God points him out to me. I'm like, oh, to want to do it, <laughs> to desire it, to take joy in that, the joy set before you, to have a horrible death so he can take my inheritance <laughs> and and walk it out in the earth. Uh, that's a miracle, you know. It's an absolute miracle. Um, so, but this is what God wants. This is what the new covenant is. So if you want it, like, you know, you got to know God exists and rewards those who seek him. Uh, knowing it exists, go for it. Like, if you didn't know healing exists, you'll never ask. Mm. You know, like, but then you find it in the scriptures. So find it in the scriptures so that you know that this is what God wants. To put on a new man that's created to be like God, you know, partake in the divine nature, be, full, be fully conformed to the image of Christ. You know, have Christ fully formed within you. It's It's all there. <laughs> to the, the, the fullness of the statue of Christ, which is the risen Christ, you know. Uh, uh, once you see it there, and you say, okay, God, I see it. You have to do this. It's a miracle. Because anyone can be a good Christian. If you're not a good Christian, just find a different church that has lower standards. <laughs> you know, now you're a good Christian. Uh, <laughs> you want to be a son of God? You, none of that even exists. It's not even, not even relevant. There's no Methodist sons of God. There's no Pentecostal sons of God. There's no intersectional sons of God. There's no deconstructed sons of God. There's only sons of God. It's a class of being that you are. And uh, it's not male or female. And from there, you can be, you know, the bride or God's princess or, you know, whatever. It's like, like human just because it's got man in it doesn't make it male. And the son of God is like a class of beings. So it's a state before God. And uh, so that is what you want to be. And so only God can do that. And but that is a dying and rising again, because sons of God live by invisible promises, the nature of God, and not by touch, taste, see. So um, I remember Kirby once saying, you know, if you can go around the world uh, for a year, would you would you want a promise from God to say God says, okay, go around the world? Do you want that, or do you want you know five hundred thousand dollars in the bank before you go? Wow. <laughs> The answer is simple. You want the money up front. You don't get in the airplane without any money and then do that for a whole year. Why Unless you you're Chris Blackaby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't, but you don't want the promise. Yeah. And Kevin said, it was very good. Kevin goes, you know why you want the money in the bank and not another promise? Because you hate faith. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> wait, 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 only Kevin could say it. He goes, because you hate faith. <laughs> mm. But we don't want a promise. We want the nature of God. We want, we want it in our hands. We want touch, taste, see now up front. You know, that's uh, either the biggest sin. If you're if you're a rabbi, what you'd say the biggest sin of David is. We think Bathsheba because we're we're morally orientated as Christians. We have a moral take on 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 scripture, okay, or moral emphasis, okay. Uh, but if you're a rabbi, you say no. David's biggest sin was counting his army. 
because 70,000 people died. Look at the, look at the fruit of it. Mm. And there's going to be more. He looked at his army, counted his army, looked at his bank account before he traveled. Didn't want to promise. He looked at his, to his own strength. Man. Yeah, I know. It's, it's huge. So, and that's us with everything. We look to look to the natural to judge by our taste, touch, see, sensual. And then we make uh, a judgment by our knowledge of good and evil on that rather than just believing a promise. If God says, in the seed is everything it needs to grow into a fullness of a tree. So if God says, I'm telling you to go around the world, on that promise, you can go around the world or start a business or anything. Okay. And sons of God live by that because. That's how heaven works. You imagine you're in heaven and, uh, you know, you go to God and God says, all right, uh, go over there and build me a new stadium. You don't go, where's the money coming from? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. angels don't go, oh, where's the money coming from? You know, show me the plans. Show me the, show me the, the approval. You know, uh, when, how are you going to get that? They don't ask that. Mm. They just go and do it. Okay. Because the word will form everything in heaven. Well, we had to bring heaven to earth and the word will shift everything. But, you know, if God said to me, Chris, uh, I want you to go to Las Vegas tomorrow and buy the, buy the Super Bowl stadium and have an outreach there. And we're like, what? <laughs> like my natural mind and soul just kicks in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I don't have faith for that. So I don't believe that that word will, will do it. You know? But, uh, there is a grace for it in the moment. If if God asks to do that, mm. <laughs> the grace because faith is a gift. <clears throat> you can't even believe on your own. God will give you the grace to believe the word. Okay, so you, you have to see it's in Scripture first. As we say, you have to see healings in Scripture before you go. Otherwise, we don't you know it exists. Mm. So now we know it exists. If you want want that, you say, God, I see this exists. Sons of God live by the promises of God. Live by the Spirit, and I want you to father me into that, which would be a very different process to me or someone else. If you get fathered into it, it's going to be a different process. You can't compare at all. That will drive you crazy. Mm. Because some will step in and they'll just, in your eyes, you know, go woof into sonship and you're still here trying to believe that the, the book balance, your checkbook will balance on Friday, you know, whatever. But you've got different DNA. You have different childhood experiences, and that's your privilege to overcome them. Mm. You can't judge. Um, uh, Rick Joyner in his um, final quest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the other dog. story. Yeah, the dog. Yeah. <laughs> this guy gets at the top, and this guy on the throne. These people on the throne, they you know they cared for children. But they didn't do anything because they did what I asked them to do. <laughs> that's love. They love. They love. They laid down his life for these kids, and that guy's on the throne. Because he didn't kill his dog. Mm. <laughs> he was so angry because he had a cerebral palsy or something, a multiple sclerosis. And he was so angry at the bitterness of his life. And he chose not to kill his dog in that moment or damage his dog or kick his dog. And in that moment, he overcame generations of stuff, you know, of anger against God. And we don't know how hard that was for him. So we don't know. You can't measure anything. Yeah. And when That's we so good. when we get to heaven, we see that people on the thrones. We're like, that dude. Mm. <laughs> who are they? We'll say, who are these people? I've never heard of them. But we'll say, and God say, yeah, they overcame. They did what I asked them to do. They became love in their place. So the good news about, you know, to be a great Christian or a powerful Christian, you sort of got to be like, in the city or around people or or something, you know, where you can have the fruit of of effect. But to be a great son of God, you could be. Uh, you know, a milkmaid in the north of Norway with pitch black, you know, four months a year, freezing cold, no money. You only know the, the 17 people around you in your village and you can rule and reign. Mm. You can become love. You can forgive your enemies. You can bless those who curse you. You can take joy in the word of the Lord and believe in his goodness against what you see. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. So anyone can become a great son of God. Yeah. And so I think we should talk about this more, the, the comparison effect, which happens, you know, like oh, yeah. with me and, and the spaces I'm in, it's so easy yeah. to compare yeah. like effectiveness yeah. and who's really, and 
it's a tension, right? That tension that we keep ourselves in. Like what you're saying is challenging even to me, like it's re-challenging me to keep that perspective, keep the tension to not, you know. So I think it'd be good to talk about like, and and by the way, I, I bring up this word purpose, but we talk about I am, right? Like my purpose is who I am. It's not what I do. And I am love, right? When you said, let's yeah. call this maturity is love. I'm like, that's amazing, right? Maturity is love. But I want to, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is how, like, okay, this milkmaid in Norway yeah. has a the same fulfillment, the same happiness, satisfaction. Yeah. It's not like this milkmaid is like depressed and, oh yeah, but I, I'm doing, you know, I'm love, but I, I hate my life or something like that. Like, can you, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So what are you, uh, are you saying she's not comparing? No, what, what I'm saying is that how does someone, what are some things that will be going through someone's life for them to kind of know, like, yeah, I am, I am in a good place. Oh, like, yeah. I'm not on a stage, but this so, is good. I'm looking after my grandson. This is awesome. You know, yeah. <laughs> we may not think it's awesome, <laughs> but it may be very difficult because you have given something up maybe for it. You don't have to, it doesn't have to, but you may have sacrificed one thing for another. Because God asked you to, you know, um, and you, you just said yes. What God asked you to, like, um, what's who's the guy uh, uh, who who's had millions of salvations in Africa? He's dead now. Ronald Bonke. Ronald Bonke, yeah. So when God came to him, uh, God said, "You're you're the fourth person I've asked. I asked another mm. three people, and they all said no." <laughs> There's lots of free will involved in this. Lots and lots of free will. So Gihad Raihan Raihan Fonky was literally doing the role of somebody else. Somebody else's call, and they didn't do it. And uh, Jesus said, the farmer has two sons. He asked them to go do the field. Uh, one said yes, but didn't do it. The other one said no, but thought better of it and went and did it. <laughs> you know, in the day, he did what the father said. And in the, the day, like uh, Raihan Fonky, he ran someone else's uh, race mm -hmm. without giving up, giving up his own for it. And uh, so it's going to be very different for different people. And some people will do exactly what they were designed to do. And it's amazing. And some people, uh, tragedy will befall them. And it's not what happens, it's how you, re how you respond. Because everything can push you in, into Christ and everything can push you into the Father. Success or failure, um, a blessing or cursing, you know, or persecution. Uh, if you have that that uh, place as a sum, and uh, you can't do it, it's impossible. So it has to be the work of God. So you tell God, you know, consider the cost before building a tower. All right, I want to be a son. God's got right. I have to move you from your own judgment to believing an in invisible promise against what you see. <laughs> And he will walk you into it because it's him. He's the author and finisher of the race. He causes you to willing to act according to his good purpose. Like he chose you, you didn't choose him. It's up to him. But you want you you set what you cooperate with. If you like Jesus, thanks for salvation. See you when I die. All right. Mm. That's your decision. Okay. But what there's lots on the table. And what's on the table is to die and rise again. Uh, and live the same resurrection life he had, Romans 6. That's what's on the table. That's what has been offered to you. And you can participate in that by telling God, I want to participate in that. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I want to be a son. I want to become love. And see, love is the opposite of fear. You know, not bravery. <laughs> love casts out fear. And love overcome, Love uh, is the erasure, erase, raises fear. And fear is the is is death. Fear is connected to death. And so, to become love, you will have to deal with your fear of death. And uh, that's not bungee jumping, all right. That's uh, <laughs> that's God knowing you and knowing your particular makeup and your fear of death, because all fear is fear of death: social death, financial death, relationship death, opportunity death. Does say financial, physical, physical death, whatever. Mm. Lack. Mm. You know, somehow what you need or desire, you're not going to have. And you and that hope and that security would in that, what that offered you is going to have to die. And God might walk you into that. And you and me will have very different walks. We ask for the same thing. 
because we're mm. overcoming different things. But in the area where it's our supply, uh, it's death because the earthly supply, human approval, your own approval of yourself, <laughs> your hopes and dreams, finances, uh, anything. Uh, your access to that is your access to life and security. And God's saying, well, I want you to believe my word alone. Mm. And so uh, I'm going to have to remove you from that. <laughs> and some people have like an amazing removal. They'll get taken to heaven. They will see heavens as like this living uh, kingdom where everyone's alive. Green is a thing, yeah, like grass is alive, joy is a person, faith is a person, like, you know, uh, the seven, uh, you know, they say, wow, how can you ever doubt this place? Mm. I'm going to live from here for, for forever. Yeah. And they come back and they're like, they have faith for everything because, hey, I know, I met the being of faith. He's always with me, you know, like, you know, or the or being, I said angel, like, you know, I don't know, I'm freaking one out. Beings is a more generic term, you know. Well, I, I, you know, I met Gabriel. Let's say that, you know, and, he, and Michael. He's got a big sword. He's with me all the time, like, you know. And like, I believe anything heaven says. There's no way what God doesn't say is not going to happen. Impossible. Mm. I just saw it, you know. I saw him cry a mountain. Okay, that's one side. Another one might be Chris. <laughs> Here's a scripture. <laughs> Do you believe it? And and will you believe it without evidence? You know. And will you, and even more so, will you love the fact that's who I am without the evidence? And uh, I'll use Kirby as another example for this, because where it really sunk into me. Um, he said that Fiona, his wife, one day asked him what type of birthday cake he'd want. And I don't think Fiona was a cook. <laughs> like, I don't think they had like a, a homey domestic life at this time. And uh, And he was like, my wife wants to cook me a, a cake. That's who she is. He was so amazed. He had a wife that wants to cook cakes. He didn't even, never crossed his mind. He couldn't believe it. My wife is the type of person that wants to cook me a cake. He was so excited about the nature of the person. He didn't really care about the cake. He didn't care if it came or not. He's like, that's who she is? He's like, wow. <laughs> and that's God. You read something in the Bible like, that's who you are? And you love the fact that that's who he is. And you enjoy that. And some people, that will be their whole life. <laughs> and other people will get, you know, get a visitation from the cloud witnesses and, and they'll do stuff together. You know, it, it's, you can't compare. Comparison is the thief of joy. It will steal your joy. When you hear a testimony, you think, wow, that's who my father is. That's great. <laughs> and it may be for you. Or God may be taking you on a different path. And that's going to be, that's a little bit difficult. It's very difficult, actually. But uh, if you've asked God and you mean it, because he, God knows your heart, all right, make me mature son of God on the earth. I want to become love. Well, if you want to be love, you have to be removed from fear and earth being your source. Because <laughs> earth's my source. I can't let it go to go do something else because I might die. I can't let go of this money or this time or this reputation. I can't miss this opportunity because that's, I might die. My, uh, you know, my, my future plans might, might not happen. That's a death, a death of hope or death of something, you know, mm. but, uh, if none of this is your supply, nothing is your supply except heaven. Ultimately, then you, then you've got freedom of choice. You can give $10 to the guy in the gutter or the $10 to the orphanage. You got freedom of choice. That ten dollars isn't all you have. It's not your supply. Heaven's your supply. Mm. And all you want to do is the word. What God wants you to do. And either you, you know, like that guy in that movie, he hears God every day. <laughs> like one of those. Uh, Ravi Ravi Kandel. Yeah. Every day God tells him what to do. Well, wouldn't that be good? Well, maybe that's his walk with God. You know, yours it might be. If you compare to that, and like, wow. Just give up, bro. Don't even get out of bed. This guy's going to work every day. You're, out, you're out like, what do I do? Oh, hey, fella. Um, God has plans for you, for your, for your hope. Oh, okay, bye. Like, yeah, well, what? Don't talk to the guy in the red jacket, the guy in the blue jumper. Like, what do I do? You know, you would drive you nuts if you compared yourself to that guy. You just mm. can't. That's what he's called to do. And you probably wouldn't want his life uh, if you had it. And uh, 
Every child must go the way they should go. And so God's going to lead you. And uh, a Bible verse believed is a word from God. And we have a very high regard for the gifts, which is good. But the gifts are there nice. until we become love. All right. So uh, then the gifts go. But love remains. They're just temporary, the gifts, you know. There's no healing in heaven. You know what I'm saying? No one's evangelizing the lost in heaven. Uh, okay, but they're, they're here for a season. And the ministry gifts, as in the ones in Corinthians, are there until we become love and we won't need them because we heal out of love, not out of gift of healing. You know, we will speak truth to someone and have revelation about them because we love them, not because we have a gift of word of knowledge. So that they're you know, there until we become love. But yeah. so, Someone comes along to you and the greatest prophet in the world comes and lays his hands on you and says, hey, Joseph, there's a word from God. And, you know, 10,000 people stop in this auditorium to hear this word. And he says, when you lay your hands on the sick, they shall recover. You know, wow. God's given me this gift of laying hands on the sick, they shall recover. Okay. But you read it in the scripture. <laughs> yeah. laying hands sick, they shall recover. Well, that's interesting. Next verse. But if you believe that verse, that's directly from God. You've had a word from God's come and lay his hands on you, not the prophet, you know. So um, a Bible verse believed. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, three times in January, God told me how happy are those who not see yet believe. And I was not interested in hearing that verse at all. <laughs> mm. But God's people believe. Belief is his love language, as, as you said earlier. Well, I was just quoting you. <laughs> Believing God is his love language. That's an amazing <laughs> quote, man. Yeah, it is. You know, it's, it's true. He wants to be believed. He's I remember spirit. he's a visible spirit. Believe my words. Will you love me for who I am? And how I receive yeah. love is you believing. Yeah. And then respond from that. Your joy and your worship comes from that. Believing he, he is who he said he says he is. I remember pursuing words and knowledge and healing and prophecy and it's great. From a place where I wanted it to be a testimony. I wasn't yep. doing it because it was an overflow of my love for this person. Right. No, I was doing it because I have a story. Yeah, and but actually, that's what they're for. Because you're not love. That's where you have them. You mm. who got who got the gifts? The Corinthians, the naughty people, <laughs> mm. the very very naughtiest church in the world got had abundance of gifts. So we're trying to qualify for them. But until you love, you have the gifts. So you can heal someone without loving them. Because you don't love them yet. You're not mature yet. So gifts are for the carnal church. <laughs> and I need the gifts, <laughs> more gifts. <laughs> I don't love the person at Starbucks uh, to give a word to speak into their life. I will need a gift to to talk to that person, and that's okay. That's where I am. But as I become love, I will need the gift. I can get rid of the gift, and I can just be the person that I am. Mm. My love will be the reason I can speak to the person at Starbucks. You know, I don't love that guy, so I need a gift to heal his knee. <laughs> you know, I don't love mm. him. <laughs> okay, but I've made a decision. I told God I want to be walking the fullness of stature of Christ in my lifetime. I see it, and now you must do it. But I've said, I will cooperate when you when you bring it up, bring it around. So, what what could that look like when when you say, "Okay, Lord, I am. I want to. I see this in the Word. I want to be." A mature son i want to yep. come into the fullness and i say you bring it about because i know i can't do it right yep. lord you do it yep. and what could that look like <laughs> practically like I, and i don't mean what's god going to say yep. i just mean like does that look like him fathering me through the day and take it might be uncomfortable situations he takes me through it can like it once again it's gonna be different for everyone you know uh and we're gonna need the body to do it as well uh, that's what the ministry gifts are supposed to be doing. And we'll get to a place where, you know, more, you know, everyone brings a psalm and a song or a word, and it's going to be very effective. And we'll cooperate with heaven. Yeah. As far as a church community that does it, we don't really have a church community that does that yet. That's happening. That's going to happen very soon because their current church community, their structures may be taken from them, <laughs> their tax free structures or something. And then we'll find out <laughs> if, if they really want to be a pastor or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and some may really, it's one of those things. 
some really disinterested people may suddenly switch on like wow this is serious and some people are really running it at the moment while like just check out and we don't know who's going to respond you really don't and um but it will always require uh, a revelation of the person of jesus uh because that's what you're becoming and so there will always have to be a relational spiritual element and uh, everyone connects differently some through dreams some actually get a revelation knowing from in the scriptures and they just get the light you know some people can hear god's voice right now some people can step into heaven uh some people learn from looking at nature etc cetera, etc cetera. there's many ways god's going to speak to you but you receive it through receiving his word his voice and he will change you in that relationship so adam and eve were supposed to walk in the force of sons of god through relationship with god but they exchanged it but not believing god would do that for them and so they reach for something because you don't know you're going to get it you reach for it yeah and so I know you're asking for a practical story. I don't really have not, it. not necessarily. I mean, you're kind of already you're you're kind of already answering it, so it's okay. great. So instead of reaching for it, <laughs> you have to walk that in relationship. It happens the, way, the same way Adam and Eve were supposed to do it. Okay, and uh, and so I would say that believing, because the devil came with another word that says. God is holding out on you. He's not going to do it. So you don't have it. You do something else. So you have to undo that. Uh, God is going to do it. <laughs> he 100% is going to do it. And um, and then for when Jesus came, uh, the devil had another run at it. And he knew that Jesus knew who the father was. Like he's not going to question the father's character. So another tact. And he said, well, if you are the son of God, it challenges identity. And now prove it. Reach with your hand and do something. And Jesus said, no, it is written. Let the word do the work. And that's the exact model. Okay. So, Chris, if you are the son of God, you know, why why X, Y, Z about your life? Why this money or why this health or why this emotion or why anything? Uh, and I, it doesn't come like that. You just feel like I should be, <laughs> you know, mm. I am. Then you reach for it because I don't feel like I'm the son of God. If, if I'm a son of God, this should be like this. But to that emotion, to that thought, I say, no, it is written. Is that you or me? It's not me. And high oh. demand. I don't know what it is. It's not my phone. Oh, not your computer? Maybe someone no. else? Around. Must be someone else. Let's, uh, let's just have a quick check here. Excuse me for a second. No? All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's I don't know what that was. It's, it's like it came through the speakers here. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> if I was prophetic, <laughs> I'd say, God, <laughs> God wants to speak to us now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. So the, 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 uh, there's only there's only uh, two questions the devil ask you. Is God good? Is he good to you? Mm. And uh, if you get through the first one, yeah, God's good. But you have to get through the second one too. He's good to me. Because um, does God love you? Yeah. Jesus died on the cross. Or does God like you? Mm. Does God like me? <laughs> you know? Does God enjoy my presence? Is God happy when I talk to him? Or does he just endure me because he has to, because what Jesus did, you know? These are things that get inside us, mm. really. And uh, But God is as happy as to see you as he was when Jesus uh, resurrected and went into heaven <laughs> after doing all his work. You know how happy he was to see him? That worth that Jesus had before God is the worth he gives you. You have the same worth. So God's just as happy to see you as he is to see Jesus. And that's our understanding before God. 
that's that that the clear conscience so we have boldness to go to the throne of grace in our time of need and just go before and say hey i'm here and just i can just be with you because i'm clean and you've got anything on your conscience to christian to christians like um the christians confess their sins yeah you're in relationship like my sins are forgiven there's something on my conscience i confess i agree with god like, hey god yeah i think like this i do this he already knows you're just getting off you and onto him. Don't carry that, you know? And uh, yeah, so God, devil's only asking, you know, is God good? And that's the thing. Maybe a really bad dad, you know? And you cannot imagine God keeping a promise at all. And so you're going to have a different journey than someone else. And you you look like you've got three steps along the journey. Someone's got 23, 20 steps along the journey. But that's not how God sees it. God sees what you're overcoming, like the guy who didn't he's stuck. Mm. You know? And if all your life you get from God is cruel and ignores me and never keeps his promises, because that's in you. That's deep in you, in your DNA, in your experience, to the fact that actually God is faithful. And that's your whole journey. You may have overcome more than someone who has international ministry with God and planted churches with God. He, he had to overcome different things. You don't know what someone's overcoming. You don't know that, what their fight is. And uh, and that guy who, who didn't believe God could possibly be good, finally believing he was good, he might govern 10 cities <laughs> a year ago. Mm. That's all mm. he did. You don't know what happened. Mm. So, um, I work with people who get children out of the worst of the worst situations, like the ones you see movies about now. And uh, holy smokes, like they're non-functional. Mm. And their soul is broken to a million pieces. And for them to trust another person in their life, like that's massive overcoming. That's more than me, like believing God's going to pay for my airline ticket. Mm. That's way more, mm. you know. So, you know, I'll get to heaven and that kid will be the mayor of my town, <laughs> the mayor of my city, whatever it looks like in the mm -hmm. I don't know, but as a metaphor. Because they overcame. They took so much sin into their body and so much the work of the devil into their body. And in that, they could God a good father. You know, gee whiz, tell you what, it doesn't take much for me to, to go, God, which is an accusation. <laughs> which is the way I say God, it's the way you say it. God, like, like it's in your voice, you know, it doesn't take, I, I go there so quickly. And uh, so, you know, these kids, they overcome a lot. Overcome mm -hmm. a lot so, and, but they will never, they, they may never shake hands at church or be on the door or be on worship stage, you know, ever. Like the things that we see visually in church, ministry, sure. give out stuff to the poor or, or anything. Yeah, but before they leave this body, they may have forgiven what happened to them truly and call God good. Well, they can rule and reign in the era to come. <laughs> yeah. Man. It's a who. It's a who situation. It's not what you do. It's, it's who you are. Mm. And that's what's coming. Yeah. It's a different metric it's a different um a measure it's a different currency if i can use that term it's a bit mm. crass, but you know it's like levite guy he had nothing you're expert in the old or a novice in the new be a novice in the new yeah and god wants if jesus wants a bride he won't be unequally yoked does god look like him what does he look mm. like he's a lamb that lays life down before the foundation of the world is forgiven the Lord, they know not what they do. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how we, we are to be, to represent him. One day he'll wrap things up. But in this era, our overcoming our, our Adamic selves is to become the new Adam, which is love. Mm. It walks in relationship with the Father with a clear conscience. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Boom.
Mic but, drop. But as you say it, it's so obvious, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. what religion are you talking about? You go, oh, yeah, that's right. Like, you know it. As I say it, you, you know it, you know? So I'm not actually telling you anything. I'm just reminding you of what you know, what's already inside you. And this mm. is the foolishness of preaching. Your soul is now lining up with what is true. What it was before we start talking, because I hope <laughs> truth has been expressed. And so what's inside you is coming out because you already, you already achieved it. Do you believe on whom you sent? Yes, your work is done. You, you know, enter Christ for us, you cease from your strivings and your works. You've ceased, it's done, you have it. You're it. The thing you want, you've got it. And now all we're doing is releasing it. And how do you, does it release? Through hearing the word, which could be reading yourself, someone speaking to you, uh, a dream, a revelation, looking at a river, like somehow it comes to you and you go, that is my father. And now it, it can, you change your mind about how things are, about who, who he is. He's not holding out on you. And he would do it for you. You don't have to reach with your own hand. It will come through a promise. And you cooperate with that promise, but it comes through a promise, which is the nature of God. All these promises are his nature. Mm. Man, so again, we'll, we'll come back to just some examples here with your own life, right? How you are like, hey, I know I'm not doing public ministry. The Lord has told me. So yeah. you don't do public ministry. Yeah. You, you close the door to that. Um, and then you're, you're, you sense, okay, it's time for some public ministry. And so then you open the door to that. Yeah. Uh, maybe there are people here that have felt that word either through the Bible or someone else or something going on or a dream or a vision or in their conscience, right? An unction. And they're like, oh, the Lord said that to me. And then maybe they didn't do it. Can we just talk about the free son? Like so many times you and I have talked about choosing as a free son, making a decision as a free son. Yeah. Um, can you touch on that a little bit? So what happens if they didn't do it? What? Yeah. You get, so it's choice and you live in that choice. Um, and so uh, before I went back into ministry the second time, God gave me two options before I went back into ministry. And they were great options. And me at that time, I'm going into ministry, uh, thought it was Satan. <laughs> I'm about to go into ministry. And someone offers me this job in Los Angeles, which is a crazy good job. And something I would love to have done would have been good at. And so clearly it's a distraction from ministry. <laughs> so I went into ministry. <laughs> and after two years, I burned out. <laughs> right? And so I have a lot of misgivings about that. And um, first of all, I thought I was the victim. And then I, I realized I'm not the victim. I'm the perpetrator. <laughs> I called God, who I was preaching about, <laughs> representing, I called the voice of God Satan, right? Okay, not good. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, and then I lived in the result of my uh, decision. And so I lost out on some experience and some things in this earth. However, the work going to do in my heart still happened. Just a different mm. one, a different way. So there's times and seasons and times come and go. You, you can't, that is gone. Like if God wanted you to be the under 19s captain for cricket for New Zealand, uh, sorry, bro. <laughs> I was gone. I know we've got Christians going up near the timeline now, but just to say for the sake of this conversation, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's gone. But what God wanted for you in that, he's kept. Mm. That season comes again, and the season comes again. And the more you understand him, the more you'll be able to uh, agree with his voice and know him. And it's been a learning thing for me because I said no to that job in Los Angeles because I did not understand God would be that good to me. So it wasn't even an option to me. I dismissed it out of hand. I didn't even give it much thought. Just, nah, like, sorry, bro. I'm going to Adelaide to be a pastor. And uh, yeah. And then the day came when I realized what I'd done. I couldn't, it was like, it was a hard moment. Mm. <laughs> Difficult moment. And uh, so, uh, and then 
as you know, something that I've tried to do, which is not for everyone, it's just a expression, is I tried to live in just obeying what I understood God to say. Where I don't naturally hear the voice of God, you know, Chris, what's God saying to you now? I don't know. Because I love the world, He gave His only Son. I think, you know, I don't know. And I believed that in doing what God asked you to do, all the resources would be there. You don't have to ask anyone. Like George Mueller with his orphanage, you just do what God asks you to do. Um, God's will, God's bill, you know. <laughs> and uh, if it is His will, He's going to provide for it. And I chose, this is not more spiritual, I chose a way uh, of not telling anyone anything ever. I just do it. And so, and God started shifting me traveling around the world, which wasn't my natural thing to do. And people just probably assumed I was a very rich person spending lots of money. <laughs> but I never, never really had much more money than for the end of the day or for next week. And um, uh, in that, in uh, so I voluntarily entered that. I feel God invited me into it as well so because it excited me. I listened to George Miller audio book. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing in my life? And so, <laughs> you know, same God. So I just used his pattern. I didn't make up a new pattern. You know, I just copied him completely <laughs> while he said how he did it. And I just tried to start following God. And on the day one, when I... I freaked out. I freaked out and uh, I got really angry with God. I'm like, God, uh, you abandoned me. Like, my first thought, no money's coming in. I'm like, God, you abandoned me. And that was always in there. <laughs> mm. It was in there when I was a pastor. It was in there when I was all the other things. It was all hidden. When the water goes down, you find what's down there, you know. And I was really angry with God. I wanted him to feel my pain. Like, you sit up there, you know, I'm putting words for it now. I'm down here suffering. All I've done is try to serve you my whole life. And you've, you know, you haven't given me so much as a goat, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. know. But oh, uh, you brought us out here to die. You brought us out, yeah, you brought <laughs> us out here to die. <laughs> That's more like it. That's actually, I was in the desert. I was in Turkey. So <laughs> I, was, I, was in, I was in the desert. And uh, yeah. And I got really angry with God. And God can wear this. It's fine. It's like, you raise kids, yeah? You got kids, you know? And sometimes you do things the kids are like, that's so unfair. You're a terrible dad. Yeah, well, it's going to happen. We hate you. Well, it's not a popularity contest. You're not eating sugar for breakfast, lunch, and dinner or something, you know? Mm. And later, that was, you can wear it. It's okay. You, it just, you don't want the kids to say it, but you can wear it. For, for the long-term goal, okay? God can wear it. And sometimes he brings it up, you know? Sometimes uh, he brings it up. And we've said this before on this podcast, I'm sure. But, you know, if you break your arm and it doesn't set properly, you have to make the same break. Just reset it. So in childhood, you know, if your dad treated you poorly and it breaks that part of your soul that doesn't set properly, well... A way, not the only way, a way God can deal with that is, right, okay, let's reset that. <laughs> and he has to make the same break. So you feel like your dad abandoned you, then God may give the appearance of, of abandonment to break. He goes, and I was always here, and that set it properly. See, I was here the whole time. And, so or in finance or something else. And uh, so that's... Definitely one thing that's happened to me, God's recreated wounds in me through a circumstance. And uh, I had a, a disproportional response <laughs> mm. like to the situation, like a two-year-old can have. Well, zero to 100. It's not that big a deal, bro. You know, but that's all you see. And uh, I, yeah, deep things in me. And I wouldn't know they're in there, but that, that's, that's what only God can make you a son of God, there's nothing I could do to address those issues in there. Mm. Are you good? You could have me with no money in Turkey. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then, I mean, that's a pretty extreme example, but it does make a clear thing. And then mm. there's obviously very small things and minor things every day. Um, but God is going to do it if you say it. 
So I committed to this task and God had to break my fear of death. And me running out of money in Turkey wasn't like a, if I ran out of money, it wasn't a, a money death or a food death. Like I know you ring up your dad or get a credit card and pay it off over the years. You know, you, you know, I'm not fearing financial death or physical death. I felt reputational death. Like I'm an mm. idiot. <laughs> I thought I heard from God and I'm just going to go around the world and he's going to pay for it. Like what an idiot. <laughs> you know, and I thought, what well, am I going to tell people? You know, I left ministry to do this and that, you know, that wasn't necessarily a celebrated decision. Okay. Mm. But now it's failed. And also like I was 40 or late thirties or I wasn't, I've got no money, no assets. And now you know, I have to ring my dad. Hey dad, you know that God you don't believe in? Yeah. He didn't pay for my trip to Turkey. <laughs> Could you let me $2,000 and get me home? You're like, it's like, that was the death I felt. I felt, mm. and I felt, and I felt very unspecial to God. And that is death when you think God's not going to look after you. And um, so that's the fear of death that God had to deal with. Like, hey, don't rip your reputation, bro. <laughs> you think this is, wait, wait till we see what I'm going to do with you later on. You know, don't worry about your reputation. And be, I was always here because uh, I don't know my story's around, but um, I, I had the money in my suitcase in um and for for that day mm. and, and that rolled on from there but i had to accuse him of abandoning me before to open all that up mm. show me to so clean it up to show me he'd never abandoned me and the money was always there <laughs> in my and what, so what you're saying is the accusation was also already it was there and oh yeah just the yeah but you just never saw it because when you're a pastor yeah. i went, went to a church my church had strong giftings and strong leadership and uh, great worship. And they paid me well for idea. They worked part-time, but they paid me really well for a part-time worker. You know, I lived in Australia, which is like a luxurious, great place to live. Life's good. Mm. And the congregation were great too. They were like, oh, very grateful and very honoring. And I ran the youth group and they were all very enthusiastic. Like when the gospel was producing fruit, <laughs> but uh, it's going to take me out of all that structure to uh, find out. I'd, I'd never find those accusations in me because hmm. the church kept working so well because of the leadership wow. of the structure. So I, I could live my whole life without finding the fact that I was very, very, very angry with God. And I believed in my core that he's the God that abandons me. Yes. That's what I believed. So this is what's interesting, right? Like what you just said, because the church doing such a good job. So many people don't know the accusations they carry that are very strong. Yeah. And interestingly enough, like when, when I'm journeying with someone, we do some kind of coaching and they are like, oh yeah, like I have this assignment. I know the Lord's given me. As they engage that, all these accusations start, you know? And so, so taking all that into account, let me ask you this. So, you can't say to me, hey, Joseph, here is proof that the Lord told me to restart ministry, right? You can't say to me, oh, here no. is proof no. that I, I he told me to travel. Day anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, say that again. I double guess it every day. <laughs> so so then this faith, because you're just going, I believe, and I am moving on it. Yeah. That, you know, we talked about at the beginning how things are changing and uh, the expression is going to change. And let's say there's someone listening and they're in a current expression with certain ways of thinking around church and ministry and it's, you know, religion or whatever. And in the morning time, they, they sense God pulling them into something that is radical for them. And it's like, could he be, could he be saying, is he saying this? Can you speak to that a little bit? And the fear of what if he's not? Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of things tied to it because if it's something you really like, you, like some people will never go for their dream in case it doesn't work and then you know it doesn't work. It's best just leave it as a dream. And in the same way, it's sometimes best not to try and do great things with God because in the day you suspect that he just won't be there for you. And it's best not, it's best not to do it. It's best, best not to find out that you're not that special to God. And that's what's in us. That's what's in the human condition. Because um, by the knowledge of good and evil, we know we, we're disqualified. 
or we have an accusation like I'm like this because of the woman you put me here with or the snake you put him here with. Like we've got that accusation in us. And so, you know, it and things you don't care about, it doesn't really matter, but something you do care about, like lots riding on it. Now it's, you know, it's, it's cattle stations now. Now, now this is important. Um, it really, uh, uh, it will bring up areas of your life that you don't know. So, if when Moses said to the Israelites, hey, let's get out of Israel, let's get out of Egypt, they'd be like, yeah. <laughs> now let's walk it out. Oh, no. You know, like, because they had to believe a promise from, from God all the way into, oh, you can take that land. And they're like, we can't take that land. We're not good enough. And God said, you're not talking about you. You're talking about me because I said you could. Remember we agreed to do this? And I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And then you're finding reasons why it's not going to happen, saying it's really about you, but it's not really about you. You're saying that I won't do that for you. That's what you're saying. You know, it's about um, uh, you're making an accusation against God, right? But God got them there in the end. <laughs> so you know, you can start this process of taking some promised land of some description. You will find out things about yourself. You have to remove giants from the land. And giants is bad DNA. It's the DNA of another father. Father's not good. You're on your own. Would God really do that for you? You know, if you are the son of God, reach for this. All these things inside us. Um, when Jesus was toward Peter, he says, Do you love me? Feed my sheep, love me, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yep. And so he goes, Right, feed my sheep. Peter's like, Yep. And Jesus is like, Yep, done. Good deal. Now I'm gonna tell you that you're gonna be martyred. <laughs> like someone's gonna lead you where you don't want to go, and you're gonna die. So after he agreed to feed the sheep. He finds that he's going to be martyred. And then Peter says, what about John? <laughs> first, first response. <laughs> what about that dude? And Jesus is like, what's that to you? What's that to you if he lives forever? You know, you're being martyred. He might live forever. Uh, you have to know you make a decision before God. This is the dream. You feel invited into it or you make a free will choice. And it's different for different people. Some people like, like Jeremiah, like bro, I chose to be a prophet. So that's what's going to happen. Either take the yoke or don't. You take the yoke, you're going to be happier if you do, than if you don't take the yoke. Like we decided this before the foundation of the world. <laughs> and for other people, they have a, a, a free choice. You know, what, how do you want to be a son of God? Do you want to build furniture? Do you want to look after kids? You know, what do you want to do? Knowing that this thing you do, you always obey the voice of God. If he does call you to something else. Um, so it's different. However, the the process is the same. You get, a word comes, Chris, can you do this? Or God, can I do this? You want to do this? Yes. Really? Yes. All right. That's the word. Okay. And then you walk it out. And in walking it out, God will use all these circumstances to help you become the fullness of the statue of Christ in your lifetime. Whether you're a carpenter that needs a new machine, or uh, uh, a giant client collapsed and didn't pay you, and then you can't pay your staff. Like, did you agree to do this with God, or did you not? <laughs> you know, and overcoming that will qualify you to over, to govern in the future. You know, because you believed a word, which is to call God good, and you can't govern the next era if you don't call God good. And inside, it's a lot of accusations. Um, God's like, <laughs> we can find these together. You want to be a ballet dancer? You know, do you want to uh, be an accountant? You know, do you want to have five kids and live on a farm? You know, uh, you can, you're allowed to make these type of decisions. Uh, and you can decide to be married or not to be married. You can make that free will decision. And then sometimes God steps in and says, hey, <laughs> I want you to marry this person. <laughs> like, you know, some people's marriages are so foreordained and prearranged they couldn't get out what they wanted to. I've got two friends in Japan and they both heard from God separately that who, who their husband and wife were. And they're like, what? <laughs> but God chose them for a purpose because they had to walk through some from, from pretty tough stuff and they're doing very well. It's like an arranged marriage from heaven. Other people, it's like, God, can I marry this person? Well, do you want to marry that person? Does she, they want to marry you? Like, make a choice. And, uh, and I'll back it. Marriage is marriage. I'll back marriage. So it's going to be different. That in that choice, either God brings something to you to do or you agree to do something. 
or choose something with him, he will father you into that. And in that process, he will bring about circumstances that will change you. Not all have to be like dramatic, like finding out you, you have real anger with God. <laughs> it, could be something, it could be just very joyful experiences. And oh, wow, I thought God was good, but he's better than I thought. <laughs> it could be like that, you know? It could be like, wow, I always knew God was good, but now I know he's even better, you know? Mm. It could be, I just use that story because that was a very extreme, a clear example about me in Turkey with the money. But um, yeah, and uh, it's his job. So in you making the decision, like, did God ask you to be a coach or did you decide to be a coach? You know, well, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe God did say, hey, Joseph, leave this and do this. Or maybe mm. God said to you, what do you want to do? Because for me, to overcome my damage, in 2016, God asked me, what, or 2017, God asked me, what do you want to do? Mm. And I, did, I couldn't tell him. Because I spent all my life repressing my desires, calling them ungodly or distractions. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so one guy finally asked me, what's the desire of your heart? I was like, I don't know. Like, if you had a check there, okay, this is it. This is for life. What do you want to do? I couldn't give him an answer. I didn't know what my heart meant or what it wanted. I've been dismissing my own needs or desires or for so long, calling that Christ-like uh, rather than processing it with him. No, I couldn't even tell him what I wanted. So for me, to overcome some aspect of my unseen nature of God, he had to let me choose something. I just chose it, and he backed it. It just blew my mind. Mm. For someone else, all they do is choose their own thing. <laughs> and God says, hey, for you to become a full person, I want you to do this. <laughs> and you have to like come under that. And do that and then find out that was a really good thing at the end. Yeah. Mm. But every child's going to be different. You must know that God loves you. He's engaged with you. He has a plan for you. He knew before the foundation of the world. Every child must go the way they should go. He knows exactly the individual process and how you get those resources, how to get there, and to, a, to an end point. And uh, he's very creative. And he's a very good father. Yeah. Mm. And it's a miracle. To be a good Christian, so, so, like... You can read a book about it. But um, to be a son of God, to become love, to become like him, that is only he can do that. I mean, books are good. Scriptures are good. Testimonies are great. Ministry is great. But it is his nature that he will do that for you is, is the rest that you're in. You rest in the fact that that's his nature. Man. So good. Guys, do we still have some people here? We've had a few, co the comments have slowed down a little bit. Uh, <laughs> people probably processing this. Um, yeah, we've been going like an hour and a half already. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's, I think we've, we've covered it. That's, that's good, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's we a concept, and uh, this concept will become more and more clear in the years to come. Mm. And uh, yeah, because I think that's where, we have to go. There's no, there's no way we can't just hang out and be Christians anymore. We have to do what the original plan was to be sons of God and restore creation. Mm. And, uh, and that's going to be the hope when all the systems around us maybe fail, we're going to be, become sons. We are sons. And um, so we're becoming what we already are. That's the rest. We already are these sons. Like a baby is already human. Just got to grow mm. up. We're already mm. sons of God. It's going to grow up so good and i guess the last three years for me especially i've seen this with many people the last three years for me especially have accelerated that process and i am seeing it more and more clearly uh, where am i living from uh, who right. am i and where am i going to live from and my accusations that have come up you know yeah. to his lord and uh, new ways of thinking that have come up for me like in the last three to four years there's been a lot more of me sharing what I would like to also see in my life that previously would have been like, you don't do that. You only follow what God says and he always initiates. You never initiate, you know, but in the last four or five years, it's been amazing watching that. And it's not even necessarily that when I initiate something with the Lord, it happens, but just that relationship 
and the interaction is, is so beautiful um but man thank you so much chris thank you for your time thank you for yeah. who you are Pleasure. everyone loves you <laughs> i love you and um i know we're gonna have many more chats after this yeah definitely but, uh, Oh, I won't yeah. I'll have to leave ministry to talk to you again, though. I'll... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's you. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> what? <laughs> Me what? Maybe if all my all my things are seeking up with uh, talking to you and coming into our ministry, maybe it's not me. Maybe it's you. <laughs> maybe you're one that's controlling my life. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. All right. Well, well on that note, Thanks so much. <laughs> but yeah. you stay with me, everyone else. We're going to say goodbye and we'll see you on the next one. Bless you guys.